gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No, because I'm going to get him. This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Thursday, July 17th, 2014, 2014, 7, 17, 14. I'm Doug Hagman, co-host along with my son, fellow investigator, fellow researcher, Joe Hagman. Together we are the Hagman and the Hagman Report. Folks, we got a, just a tremendous show planned for you tonight. Our A-list guest tonight is, of course, Mr. Nathan Leal. Watchman's Cry. Uh, no, with us tonight we have uh, our guest for this evening, Mr. Nathan Liao. His website, watchmanscry.com. I'll post in the chat room, and uh, you can go to our website, homelandsecurityus.com, watchmanscry.com. Nathan has been a frequent guest on the show and uh, was scheduled to come on last week, but went through a situation where it had no running water for a period of days and has many farm animals and uh, didn't have a big surplus of water in it. Uh, really screwed up your schedule, but we're glad that your water's running again, Nathan, and glad to have you back on the show. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. Hey, I next time, recovered. Nathan. Nathan, next time, pay your bill, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, this event that I experienced, um, I don't know how much information you sh- you shared, but it was it happened on July the third in the evening right before July 4th started, and it was about 9 o'clock at night. My wife was in the kitchen, and she said, the water doesn't work, and I went down and flipped the breaker, no problem, and I flipped the breaker several times, and then I looked to my... And for those people that don't have water wells, they might not know what this means, but if you live in the city, all you have to do is go into your your faucet and turn the spigot, and water comes out, and you, you don't worry about it. But when you live in the country... We have wells, and the wells are several hundred feet in the ground in a pipe, and there's a pump that is submerged depending on how deep the well is. Ours is 250 feet deep. There's a pump down there, and then there's a pipe that comes up, the well casing out of the ground, and then a pipe comes all the way to our house, which is 400 feet away from this well pump, and then there's an actual pressure controller that tells the pump when to turn on and off. Well, that pressure controller box went kaput and it happened on july the third in the evening and i got online and looked to see if i could fix it and or to see what the problem was and it turned out that this unit has a lifespan of so many years and and my unit gave up the ghost and to replace them is to order a new unit you have to have a pump guy come out they they're very very expensive and joe you told me you guys have a pump there if you have these things they're, they cost over a thousand dollars. So I'm sitting there July the third, saying, "Okay, tomorrow's a holiday, Friday, and then we have the weekend." So it turned out to be a whole week waiting for the guy to come out. So for five, almost six days, we had no water in our house, and it was a practice run for when the grid goes down. And that's what I kept telling the family: "This is a good dry run." But you know what, um, Doug and Joe, and I called you several times, telling you that I was going through this. It is incredible the amount of mental taxing that something like this will do to an individual. And, you know, me being a watchman, I talk about the grid going down, you got to get ready. But when you're actually there and you're experiencing it, it is incredible the mental effort that goes into changing every part of our routine that we're used to. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this program on this, but I, I do want to throw this out because I – I was praying to God, and I I tried to maintain my faith the entire time, and and we did. My wife and I had peace. We knew it was going to be okay. But even though we knew it was going to be okay, it still wears you out because this is what happens. And, Doug, I I mentioned this to you on the phone, and you told me that there's a a window of of mental strength where finally most people just run out of mental strength and then they lose it. And what did you say? It was three to five days or something like that? 
Uh, about that, yeah. And, and, and I think you were on the tail end of that, my brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's incredible because I was taking notes over all the things that we take for granted when we have water, you turn the faucet. Let, let me just brief, briefly mention it just real quick. And listeners, please make note of this because if you have a to-do list, and I know if you're an awake person, you listen to this program and other programs like mine, you know that there's things to prepare for. There's a list of a lot of things, and sometimes it's hard to prioritize. Well, maybe I should get food, drive food, I should do this, that. Well, water is at the very top of the list, and it needs to be at the top of the list. And since I just went through this, I want to encourage all of you that can to move it to the very top. Bump other stuff or maybe share or itemize, but do what you can to make sure the water issue gets taken care of because this is what happened to us. When the water was out at 9 o'clock at night, there was no warning. We didn't get a memo, an email, a phone call. No one knocked on our door or told us, you're about to run out of water fill up some jugs or do something. We had none of that. It was just you went to the faucet and it was gone. When the real event happens, when the grid goes down or whatever the event that is coming, whether they're rolling blackouts, whatever it is, there's not going to be a warning. It's just going to be so. You might be taking a shower. It might be in the middle of the night when it happens. So in the morning when you go and turn the faucet, there will be no water. Okay, so this is what it's like. If you have no water stored, when there is no water, there's no way to wash your hands. There's no way to prepare food. There's no way to to get a drink of water. Now, fortunately, we did have some jugs that my wife always keeps, but there was no way to, to do the big assignment. There was no way to finish cooking dinner. There was no way to wash the dishes. So all of that is done. There's... You, how do, you, how do you plan around that? Well, if you go camping, Nathan, just pretend you're camping. Okay, well, when you're camping, you take water with you. You have paper plates, paper napkins, uh, plastic forks, et cetera, to throw away. But when you, have, you don't have that ready, the, the mental effort to make an adjustment is really taxing. And this is what I notice. When you wake up in the morning, most people have a routine. And this is what it has to do with, Joe and Doug. It has to do with the mental routine where there's just – muscle memory involved where there's absolutely no thinking involved and therefore there's no mental energy that is used to do the task that most of us do every day when they're routine. So when a person wakes up in the morning, they, they go to the bathroom, do their business, and they'll wash up, brush their teeth. Depending on the, the, the person's habits, they'll do it either before they eat or after they eat breakfast, but they, they want to brush their teeth to get the night thing out, right? And, and get the, the, that breath thing. I mean, just right there, Joe and Doug. When the grid goes down, most of us do not like having bad breath, but when there's no water, how, what do you do? So right there, you wake up, there's nothing to brush your teeth with. So that's going to be a bummer, and the whole family is like that. Okay, wash your hands, get ready for breakfast. Well, there's no way to wash your hands. How do you flush the toilet? Where do you do your business? So just in the first 15 minutes of being awake, there are adjustments that have to be made that usually you don't. Well, go outside. Well, what if it's, what if it's raining? What if, what if you're not at a place where you can just go outside? What do you do? And during the course of the first day, that's what happened. It was an adjustment, and it's like, okay, well, let's go to the store and use their bathroom or go to our friend's house. We ended up having to br- bring water in from 10 miles away in my pickup truck. I felt a drug. Uh, I filled up jugs, brought them in. But that, just doing that took two to four hours every day because it was 11 miles away each direction. That's 22 miles. I have animals, so you have to water the animals. It's been very hot here in Idaho at this point in time. The water evaporates. They need water, so you've got to take care of your animals. So what about the garden? You can't water your garden. So, ladies and gentlemen, when water is out, when water has gone, when the grid is down, People say, well, have that Berkey filter. Okay, but what do you put in the Berkey filter? (laughs) How do you water your garden? (laughs) You go down to the river and and carry it. You have a wheelbarrow. You have a donkey. What do you have? So I noticed, Doug and Joe, that by the end of the first day, it was we were working and all the work you had to do, then you're sweaty and you want to take a shower before you go to bed because who wants to climb a bed all sweaty, right? So, okay, do you take the – 
the wipey bath or with a towel bath or what do you do or do you drive to the motel to one of the parks to your friend's house so for five days we had to deal with this and i noticed that by day four and five the um, the amount of mental energy that i had was spent it, it was incredible the, the exhaustion that you go through because you're constantly thinking about this and i remember several years ago when christ church new zealand had their earthquake you remember that it, it oh, yes, I do, yeah. Yep. And I was reading the blogs of individuals who lived there who had to deal with the, the situation, and it turned out that in Christ Church, the majority of the sewer lines, thousands of sewer lines were cracked, so no one had sewage, no toilets, no water. So in the entire city of Christ Church, they ended up bringing 30,000 porta-potties, and they would just set them down in the middle of the street on a cul-de-sac, and the entire neighborhood had to share the porta-potty. And I was reading the blog of back then, of an individual that was keeping a diary of what they were going through, and they talked about the same thing. They said the routine that you're used to when it gets changed is so taxing on, on your your mental fitness that it wears you out. But they said they were noticing that by day two and three, the porta potties 30,000 porta potties were overflowing and full. The trucks couldn't empty them out, so people quit using them. So you have a whole neighborhood of individuals who have no porta potty there's, you can't go to the gas station. There's nowhere to go to use the restroom. And since it's the city, they don't have outhouses. So you have the elderly who refuse to try to make adjustments. So with stress like that, it messes with their bowels. They get constipated, and that's not healthy. And then you had people who were just having to go in the backyard, you know, do the business, the number two in the backyard, and just throw. If you don't have sawdust or dirt, what do you do? So the entire city of Christchurch – New Zealand started to stink very bad. And as I was reading the blog of this individual, they were on day 30 of this, and they they had no idea when it was going to stop or have relief. And I just went through five days, and this is what I noticed. When the guy finally arrived, I was so happy. I didn't care what it was going to cost to fix. I, I, I told him, I'm going to raid my kid's college fund to get water back. I don't care. And you start getting to the point where you're desperate, and – you just want the water. That's all you care about. Well, they showed up. They fixed it. It turned out. I, I turned the faucet, and it worked after a week. And when the guy left, within five minutes of him being gone, I went and I laid down on the bed next to my wife. It was in the middle of the afternoon, and this is what I noticed also happened. Suddenly, instantly, all my energy was gone. I, I was entirely drained. It was like... You got hit by a Mack truck with your energy, and you just wanted to 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 crash. And I wonder, well, what's going on now? And then I realized what was going on. It was the adrenaline dump. For five, seven days, you're on adrenaline, and then when it's gone, you crash. So, ladies and gentlemen, for all of you that read about the survivalist things to do this and that, bug out, where I'm going to have my knapsack and bug out somewhere and do all this thing, <laughs> As an example, Doug, bugging out is going to change the routine for everyone. So for the romantic notions of bugging out, how it's going to be fun and it's going to be camping, Boy Scout, I get to you know roast marshmallows, et cetera, it's not going to be a party. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be taxing. It's, it's going to wear people out. And those individuals that have not even made a conscious thought to process in, in advance what this has to do with it and what it takes, it's going to wear their mouth. Wow. Now, in the military, they train for this all the time. So those of you that are veterans, you're, you're listening to me talking, you go, you might be thinking, well, Nathan, yeah, you're right, but I can handle it. And, yeah, if you're a veteran and, and, and you're there, I'm not talking to you, or maybe if you're out of practice, maybe it will be a little bit difficult if you have health challenges because it's been a while. But what I'm trying to say is that when when the thing really goes down, the amount of effort and mental anguish that this is going to strike on so many people is going to be very difficult for many to deal with. And there is going to be a breaking point. I can see it already, Doug. I can see how if I was not a Christian, if, if I didn't have faith in God, I would have gone nuts. I would have gone crazy. Uh, and for the individuals who do not have scruples, who do not rely on the Bible, who do not have the Bible as their boundary – when they get desperate, they will have no problem going to the neighbors and stealing from them or by force 
by force trying to change their situation. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to throw this out there. I believe that I went through this just as a reminder to remind everyone that water is very important. And, by the way, this is a lesson for me to make some adjustments, so to have some backup plans, countermeasures, and things to rely on just in case. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a way, if you do not have water, to be able to get water, to, have, to find water, to store water, and have a way, think about it, how would you go to the restroom if you're in the city, if you're in an apartment and there's no water? If you can't flush the toilet, what are you going to do? Where do you go? That, that's exactly right. Nathan, if I could say this, um, because we, we've experienced here power outages, because, and, and our water is connected. Uh, we have a well system, uh, intricate well system with the softener and, and the treatment system and all that. But um, having said that, when our power has gone out for extended periods, so does our water, so does the ability to shower and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, use the facilities. Um, here's the thing as, as well, in addition to, to what you're talking about. It's important for the leaders of the family to understand we have to think about the dignity of not only ourselves, but of our family members. You know, there, there's a level of dignity here involved, a level of, oh, uh, uh, it goes beyond personal hygiene, which you mentioned, the, the, the mental aspect of this. And it's almost as in addition to being robbed of your practical side of things, you're being robbed, too, of, of a certain amount of dignity, at least mentally. Um, what we've done, and just very quickly, and I'll turn back over to you, is American Survival Wholesale has got uh, some portable uh they're called luggable loos, and uh, you, you, honestly, um, if you want to go uh, even more better than that, or not better than that, but uh, more extravagant, I should say, um, uh, you know, you can get yourself uh, really your own personal outhouse through uh, the camping supply stores. You know, the, you can go as as extreme as you want, but, but whatever you want to do, if you if you want to stay with the basics or go. go go to whatever level of extravagance you, you'd like. It's important to do it now in in well, in the relative quiet. Like you, before your water went out, um, perhaps you if you knew uh, two, three days before that you were going to be without water for a few days, you would have made preparations, uh, certain preparations now, wouldn't you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it, 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 all I'm saying is right now, in this relatively tranquil period, please, Think about what Nathan is saying. Learn from Nathan's <laughs> incredible, uh, uh, well, inconvenience, and plan for it. And, and think also about the dignity of the family, whether it's using the facilities or um, you know, showering. Portable showers are available. Um, collecting water, drinking water, and, and such. And plan, 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 plan. And Nathan, I want to, I want to just say this. You weathered this because I know you, you've got physical challenges that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. and I got to tell you, my friend, you you were an inspiration to me because I I, I talked to you during this time, and uh, God bless you for 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 coming on the air and and really laying it out, and saying, hey, this is the way this is the way it's going to be, and thank you for that. Thank you for being a strong and influential source of guidance for us. Thank well, you. I appreciate that. And, Doug, what you said about the dignity of others is exactly right because, you know, as a man, we, we like to make fun of ourselves. We're cavemen. We just stand around the fire and go in the woods, no problem. But a female does have more dignity. It's it's not as easy for a female. So, and I, that came into play. I have a seven-year-old daughter, and and I have a wife. And I could have roughed it if I had to, but I was willing to drive the 11 miles so that she could have a shower and just, to do that now, of course, when the real thing happens, that won't be there. But for this, I knew that the remedy was going to come in a few days. So I still did that just to maintain their sanity. And I just want to throw this out for the people that are listening. Uh, listeners, if you're taking notes, if you live in the city, here's something that you can just do that's cheap just to have as a backup plan if it's going to be a few days. And, for example, with the power outage in the back of your mind, winter storm, et cetera, or bad weather, it's going to be just a few days, and you know 
that there will be a remedy. So here's something you can have just stored in your garage just to have just in case. Number one, a, a way to use, if there's nowhere in town to and let me just use number one, number two. Number one, you can go behind a bush. Number two, that's that's not as easy. There's disease involved. There's germs. There's smell and all that. So what do you do? Well, a very, very simple thing to do is to have some kitchen bags, have a five-gallon bucket, and have sawdust. So if you have a, a bag that's pretty big, and you can go to the local feed store and buy shavings of pine shavings if you if you don't have access to sawdust, but most areas in the whole country have a feed store that's nearby, and you can buy huge bundles of, of shavings or pine or cedar in these bags, and it's not very much. It's less than 10 bucks. You have that, and just have it in your garage. When, it, when the, the, the event happens, you sprinkle a little in the, in the – you put a kitchen bag in the bucket. Oh, and also buy a toilet seat and go to Goodwill and get a toilet seat or have a good one, but you put it over the bucket – and you sprinkle some sawdust, you do the business, and then you sprinkle sawdust over it, and it'll actually hold down the odor. Sawdust is amazing. You do that enough times, and then you take out the bag and save it for when you can bury it or, or get rid of it after the event or the emergency. So just right there, Doug, is a way that people can at least have somewhere to go because one thing that when I was reading about the Christ Church event, they, the, the person that was blogging said many old people – are just refusing to to use the porta potties and, and they don't want to make an adjustment, the privacy, the dignity, all of that, and they're causing them because of the stress. They're becoming constipated, and constipation can kill you, especially if you're older and it's hard to get out of it. So we don't want that to happen. And if you have older people in your family or your, your wife, your order, et cetera, right? I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. No, I just said or could certainly make you quite ornery. <laughs> oh yeah, it will. It will. So that's an, an easy remedy. Have some extra wipes. Go to Costco or or wherever you get them. Have extra ones. And just keep that in the garage for the maybes. So also here's another thing. Look on If you look on Craigslist for plastic 55-gallon water barrels, you can get them for usually around 20 to 30 bucks or even less on Craigslist. The plastic ones that have been used for either water or food grade, you can have one in your garage and just have it full of water and have the lid on, and that water's there. You can siphon water out to flush the toilet if you have to, but it's always in your garage. And there's some – the average toilet needs two gallons of water, so a 55-gallon barrel will have um, – what is that, right? 20 flushes at least. So that's a relief for some people. And then also if if you don't have that, buy some of the pills from the survivalist places and – Doug, I know you're a source of that, and you can talk about that. The pills that can that can cleanse bad water or unpotable water, you can drop them in there or some drops of bleach. Those are just some practical things that can be done in advance. But, Doug, the, the sewage situation, when this thing really goes down, it's going to cause how much, how, how much mental, mental anguish in so many people. So I'm, I'm just sharing this, and... And I knew when I was going through this that, okay, God, that's fine. This is a dry run. It's going to teach me. But I, I'm going to share everything I'm learning right here, and that's what I'm doing. And so, Doug, you can also <laughs> comment and add some footnotes to what I'm sharing here. But there are things people can do in advance that aren't too expensive. So uh, I'm just letting the people know right now. And please oh, do it. Don't delay. I, I got to tell you, we really appreciate that. And, and folks, like I said, that during this period of relative calm, and, and I think that we – we are being uh, we are being given a gift, uh, a gift that Nathan didn't have, and that gift is this period of preparation. So you use it wisely. And um, uh, our sponsors, American Survival Wholesale, they've got they've got uh, these uh, uh, portable facilities, luggable loos, and such. Um, and if you want to go more extreme, uh, shop around. Whatever you want to do. But the fact is, the fact is, we all have to anticipate like you learn from Nathan and listen to what he's saying and, and please folks don't forget that we're all human we you know we're the dignity of our humanity needs to be respected so thank you Nathan for sharing that it really it's uh man you know it was a, it was a rough period and, and those people who are so used to uh uh their routine of Starbucks and and, uh, and um, 
you know, showers twice a day, and of course the best of the best, thinking that they're they live in the you know the the I don't know suites of the Four Seasons, they're going to have the roughest time of it all. So see, I'll just have my butler get my water for me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we're glad you're on the other side of that. Nathan. Yeah, yeah. So Nathan, um, you've you've got to have been watching the the news and everything. Uh, my goodness, we're in a headline uh, rich environment, are we not? Uh, and and you've done so much research into uh, it, watching the headlines today. I kept thinking of you and thinking of the words prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, it just uh, it seems like we're we're closing in on the final chapter here of uh, of, of this book and entering uh, into another one. Indeed, Doug, and in the remainder of this program, I'm going to share some information with the listening audience, and the information that that I'm going to share is going to be, for some, disturbing. It's going to be difficult to digest. It's going to be a challenge to hear, but I'm going to share information from, and, and I like how you qualify and preface your program saying we need to look from different dimensions, different different perspectives, including the spiritual. I'm going to share from the spiritual today on some events that are taking place right now as we speak here in the United States and worldwide. And I'm I'm doing this, I'm going to do it from the standpoint of why we need to try our our, our best to readjust our focus on how we are processing the present world events. Because if we only process what's going on right now through the physical or through the intellectual, we're going to miss a huge part of the of the big picture because this event is multidimensional, not even three dimensional. It's fourth dimensional because it goes into the spirit realm. But it doesn't just have a a surface image. It has a side. It has a top. It has you can we can see it from behind, below. There's a breadth, a width, a height to what's going on, and we have to be able to look at this thing through the correct lens. And the correct lens must include the spiritual. It must include the scriptures, the Bible. It must include acknowledging that there is a God, a creator, and that there are also enemies of our soul, the dark side of spiritual reality, Satan, demons, fallen angels, and a script, an end-time script, Bible prophecy. There's a huge, huge picture that we're going to look at. I'm going to share some things. And, Doug, I want to qualify. I I talked to Joe before the program, and I said, Joe, I'm going to mention something, and Joe – Further on the program, I'm going to talk about it. You said it's okay. It's going to be a difficult thing yeah. to to address, but I have to do it because it's going to show where we are in the timeline. The the events that are taking place right now, if they're only looked at from the intellect, will scare most people. If we do not include God, it's going to create panic. It, it will create confusion. It will create blindness and and trying to resolve it in our own strength, or unfortunately it could cause people to listen to the counsel of just other humans, which is not godly counsel. So ladies and gentlemen, a lot of things are happening right now, but we need the counsel of God. I so appreciated what you said at the beginning of the program, Doug. You mentioned people leaving the country and unable to leave. Who can do it? I want to read a few verses real quick before the break. I see we have a few minutes left. And it comes from the book of James, chapter 2, verse 5. And ladies and gentlemen, I know there's a lot of, there are many individuals out there, there are many of you out there that are on fixed incomes, you're retired, you're not wealthy, you're struggling. Some of you are in the worst financial struggle of your life because of this economic depression that we're in right now. And when you hear people talk so easily about just, yeah, leave the country and grab a passport, hire a catamaran and just have fun on the way down to South America. And you hear that, and it gets frustrating. Well, I understand where you're coming from. And in in James 2, verse 5, it says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? So, Doug, Joe, a lot of our listeners are poor, but the (laughs) – Just because they're poor does not mean that they're losers. It doesn't mean they're failures. It doesn't mean that it's their fault. I mean, things happen. People have injuries. They have 
developments outside their control, things happen. And God allows those things to happen for a reason, because in James it says God chose the poor to be rich in faith. So, ladies and gentlemen, if some of you 10 years ago were very prosperous, you were a developer, you were a home builder, you were a real estate agent, living off the the momentum of the the great prosperity of America and, and the dream, the great American dream, but now, since the crash of 08, life is different and you wonder why. Well, before the crash, you were rich in, in the physical realm, but perhaps your faith wasn't rich. And Joe and Doug, God is going to use this event, this timeline, this present season, the present weather, to teach his children faith that they never had before. And the only way to learn faith is to go through the trial. There cannot be a testimony without a trial. I, I can attest to that with my water trial just recently. We develop fruit of the Spirit. We develop patience. We b- develop faith, trust. We develop the wisdom to know that God will come through by being in that situation where we need him to come through. It's easy to read it in a book. It's easy to hear a sermon about it, but nothing can teach us better than personal experience and trial by fire, trial by being there. We have to spar. We have to shadow box with, with the challenges of life. We have to see the obstacle and, and have God lead us over it or through it. So obstacles are opportunities for faith. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're poor and you hear the, the words of get out of the country and it frustrates you, well, Doug, I have an opinion about leaving the country, first of all. With the uh, events that are coming here, in Babylon, America, the Bible tells us, and it's very clear in Jeremiah 51, verse 33, it tells us that Babylon is a threshing floor. Babylon, in the end of time, will be used to thresh the people of God. And in Jeremiah 51, 33, let me read this verse. It says uh, right here, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor when it is time to thresh her yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will then come. There is going to be a harvest for the people of God eventually, eventually, when Jesus returns. But until then, the church needs to be threshed. And threshing hurts. Threshing is not pleasant. But if everyone escaped Babylon and went and and sat on a deserted island and, and drank iced tea and just floated on the waves and was not threshed, would they really have their spirits molded and would they really have the opportunity to learn spiritual lessons that if they had stayed they wouldn't have learned there is a very very strong precedence for this in scripture when jeremiah was trying to plead with the children of israel not to flee to egypt after nebuchadnezzar came and and i I see that we're at the top of the hour do you want me to stop and i can finish this on the other side or you want me to finish my thought you can go ahead and finish your thought and then we'll uh after that we'll take the break Okay, and I'll just give I'll, I'll just preface it, and then on the other side, I'm going to go into this because this has to do with the timeline that's coming. Jeremiah, for 40 years, begged Israel to repent. They didn't do it. Finally, Babylon showed up, surrounded Jerusalem, and, and invaded Jerusalem. A lot of people died. The remnant that was left didn't know what to do, and they said, should we leave and go to Egypt? And Jeremiah went and sought God, and God said, no, you stay here under the the oppression of Nebuchadnezzar, and I'll take care of you. The people didn't want to hear that, but there were reasons that God said that. And on the other side of the hour, I'm going to explain it, because those same things apply to us here in America. And if the people of God can get a hold of the principles in this, then it will be much easier to weather the hurricane that is approaching right now. There is a tsunami of horrible events coming, but with God's strength, we will be able to weather them. And I'll stop there so that we can go to the the break. Very well said, Nathan. And uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, I guess what you went through and, and what you're talking about in Jeremiah is a is a test of faith. We have to um, you know rely on God more than our own carnal minds, and uh, sometimes that can be a, a battle, a huge battle in and of itself. But with that, we're going to go to the top of the hour break, folks. Our guest tonight is Nathan Leal. His website. Watchmanscry.com Bookmark it as he has updates to uh, news articles, audio sermons and a whole bunch of uh, insightful uh, news and events. Also his forum, interactive forum on there. 
is a great tool for networking. We'll be right back after these short messages. News in two minutes is back, and it's up next. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of this Thursday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this July 17th, 2014, with our special guest, Mr. Nathan Leal. Nathan, before the break, you were talking about uh, uh, verse in Jeremiah and how uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and, and overtook Jerusalem and, and the people all wanted to flee to Egypt. And Jeremiah, uh, the prophet, from the uh, received the word from the Lord and, and the Lord told them to stay. Uh, can you start off by uh, giving the what chapter and verse that starts in? Um. Uh, uh, sure. And I want to preface the things that I'm going to share right now with a challenge for all the listeners out there. I know that there's a lot of flavors uh, and there's a lot of levels of spiritual involvement, should I say, or fellowship with God or or even lack of fellowship. There's The condition of the, the people's walk with God is all over the map. Some of the listeners right now are away from God. They're backslidden. Maybe they're mad at God. Um, Listeners, wherever you are, I just want to challenge you and let you know that God cares about you. He loves you. No matter what you have done, he he can restore your soul. He can encourage you. He can give you peace, and he can forgive you. And over the last few months, God has been challenging me Doug and Joe to to offer up some some hope and some information for the listeners out there that are that are beat up, that are hurting, that are broken, that are wayward, that are lost, that are backslid, etc. I have a, a burden for the backslider that's out there because for the most part we live in Babylon now, and it's not easy to live in Babylon. I, I understand that, and God understands that, and I know that a lot of people struggle living here in Babylon. The days have become dark. There's a lot of temptation out there, and and some people have done things that they regret now, and they don't know how to fix it. They don't know what to do. And I just want to say that, listener, if this is you, there's hope for you. The loving kindness of God, the forgiveness of God starts out every day. It's new every morning. That's from the book of Lamentations. And I am starting a new series of programs that are available on my website at watchmanscry.com, and they're, they're going to be a theme called For Such a Time as This. And I'm, I started out with the first one. I just released it this last weekend. And it has to do with how to repent. For those people that are out there struggling in the situation that I just mentioned, I have a sermon I just put out. And it's not to beat you up. It's not to throw rocks at you. It's, it's not to be to, to, to be self-righteous against you. It is to help everyone out there that is struggling. So I want to challenge you, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to watchmanscry.com, it is on the right side, latest sermon message, David and the Heart of Repentance. For those of you that hear the the different people on programs like this that say, we have to repent, America has to repent, some people aren't sure what that means, Doug and Joe, and so what I've done is made a sermon, and I'm going to talk about this to show people what it actually means. It's really not that difficult, but then again, it's one of the hardest things a person can do because then they have to face their issues and their mess, but God can hold our hand through it. And, listener, I just want you to know that without God, <laughs> the days that are coming, whether we have God with us or not, we're still going to walk through these days. Whether we have God's help and his peace, we still have to navigate the mess. And the navigation will be a lot easier if we have God at our side. Now, I'm not talking about faking it, and I'm not talking about pretend. It's easy to do that. It's easy to to use buzzwords and say, I'm a Christian, and get a T-shirt and have a bumper sticker, etc. I'm talking about the real thing. God knows those that are his, and God knows those that are pretending. Maybe you've been pretending, but you're seeing that it's not working out so so well. So I just want to encourage with that, Doug and Joe, I'm supplying these messages. I know in the natural, most people do not want to deal with their spiritual mess. It, it's not easy. I, I understand that, but... Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a, a parent, if you are a father or a mother, you have people that you're responsible for, if you deal with your spiritual mess, then you will have the tools and the strength to help them because you're leading them. They, you are their example. How many Christian mothers and fathers say they're Christian mothers and fathers, and, and but their kids are a mess, their teenagers are a mess, they're they're 
kids are making wrong choices, well, we need to do what we can to be the right example. And I know that sometimes things happen outside our control. I'm not talking about that. But we have to at least lower the odds. And then if we have God on our side, then he can protect your your teenagers and your loved ones from the mess. So this is good news, what I'm sharing, and I'm, I'm prefacing this program with hope. I'm going to share some things that are going to get a little bit scary and disturbing, but I'm prefacing right now that I have to share the dark side because, or let us know that there's a challenge against the dark side, but we have the light. We have the light of God, and we have the answer and the remedy. So getting back to Jeremiah, Joe, and thanks for reminding me. Several years ago, I believe it was almost two years now, Doug, where I was on your program, or going on two years, it's pretty close, a year and a half maybe, where I came on your program and shared, it was around the time of the election, the inauguration. And yes, yes. I, I shared that a spiritual event was about to happen to America. Do you remember that, about the invasion of Babylon? And some I did. creatures? Or I do, yes. Okay. You, you did. You did. And in fact, um, Nathan, what we're doing in the process of doing it, I, I don't mean to take you off your, your uh, stride here, but you, just so people know, what, what, I'm, what I'm putting together is uh, um, a page where, with uh, guests. In, uh, for example, all your shows will all be together. And um, so for easier archival access. Okay, so I just want to Good. let people know that that's in progress. And uh, Nathan, I think it was right around January, if I'm not mistaken, of um, uh, 2013. I could be mistaken on that, but it was right after the uh, inauguration. Right. Okay. Well, it was during that time. I, as a watchman of God, I, and by the way, that's my website, watchmanscry.com. I don't know if I mentioned that. I've been at this for, I don't know, seven years. I'm not sure now. I've lost count. But. God has God. I'm a minister. I I come from the background of the Assemblies of God. I'm an old-fashioned Pentecostal minister. I but now all my sermons are now online. For, if you have new listeners that are hearing, who who's Nathan? And over the course of, of of time, God has as I've sought Him and asked Him, what's going on in the world? And by the way, Doug and, and Joe, it takes a lot of effort to seek God. It takes time to actually shut the door. Tell the family, don't disturb me. I'm going to be in my office. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be praying. It takes a lot of prayer time in getting into the scriptures and, and seeking him, asking God what's going on. There are many hours involved in this. It's, it's not automatic. I don't make this stuff up. And so over the course of years, as I've asked God to please show me, open my eyes, let me know what's going on, he's helped me to to understand some verses and some events that are happening in Scripture. And one of the things that God has opened my eyes to is that the events that take, took place with ancient Israel and the Old Testament can be mirrored with the United States. Not exactly, but very close. And the reason for that is because, for the most part, humans are wired the same, and God sets up kingdoms pretty much in the same way. When he sets up a kingdom and raises up a kingdom on earth, the kingdom needs to be righteous. If they're not righteous, he judges them and, and spanks them. That's the way it's always been. That is in the Bible. So he made this arrangement and this covenant with Israel. Israel, you obey me, you follow me, you do what I say, you follow my statutes and principles, you don't go after the false idols and the Baals, I'll bless you. If you don't, you will be punished. The same thing goes for America, so we can see the mirror of events for America. Now, I know that there are people out there that have a problem with this. They say, America's not in the Bible. How can you say this? Well, the rules of righteousness are established. God does not change. He wants nations to behave. And we can go throughout the world and observe the cultures of different nations, and we will see a theme if we do this, if we look through the spiritual lens. When, cult when the cultures of nations are involved in voodoo and witchcraft and the dark elements of, of Satanism, like, for example, in Haiti or Jamaica, they're usually very poor nations. Things don't go well for them. They usually have a dictator that, that is controlling their country. And then when we look at, at nations that are following the, the Judeo-Christian way of, of thinking and governance, usually they're more blessed than the other ones. So this is a standard that has – this is a very 
established standard. We can find this in history. So for the United States of America, God has shown, shown me as I've sought him that we are going to go through the same types of judgments that Israel went through when Israel fell, uh, fell back in the days of Jeremiah. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, the story about the failure of Israel is, is recorded in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, and for 40 years he tried to warn Israel to stop their misbehavior. They didn't listen to him, but it took 40 years before God ju finally judged them. Five different kings came and went, and finally on the fifth king, that's when God showed up. So God is very patient. First of all, that's one of the first principles of, of judgment. When God raises up a voice to warn, it doesn't happen the next day. The voice will just start crying out and asking the people to repent, challenging them, begging them, pleading with them. And most of the time, they don't. The people mock and they say, well, where's the judgment? Five years has gone by, 10, 15, 20. What's wrong, Jeremiah? You liar. You're making this stuff up. And today, Doug and Joe, we have the same similar thing happening. God has raised up voices. He's raised up watchmen who understand what time it is, who are trying to warn America, who are pleading and begging. And God is even using supernatural means to show the watchmen that these things are coming. God has... At times, with some of the watchmen and other individuals, he has shown them dreams of events that are coming and prophetic visions. That's a whole other category of things that people will argue about. There's a certain portion of Christianity that, that says, nah, God doesn't do that. There's no such thing. And if you say or claim that God showed you a vision or a dream, you're, uh, um, you're, you're lying, you made it up, you're a false prophet because that doesn't happen. And so there are people out there in Internet land that because of their theology discount the warning that God's trying to do right now. But, ladies and gentlemen, it does not matter how many blogs and websites and forums that people want to discount the watchman. It doesn't matter because the events are taking place right now. They are happening before our eyes. The United States is falling. The dollar is going to crash. It, the, the United States is going to be invaded. The watchman has seen many things, and it's not just the watchman. You can go to YouTube and type in visions of the end of America, and thousands of, of YouTube videos will come up, not just from watchmen, but from everyday folks, mothers, fathers, grandparents, children, teenagers. God is showing this thing to a lot of people. Now, Doug and Joe, I'm not going to just spend a lot of time justifying or trying to prove how it's real. That's not my job. If people don't want to believe it, fine. It doesn't matter. My job is just to warn, and your job is to warn. So moving from there, let's go forward. God revealed and showed me, and I'm about to give a flashback reminder of something that's incredible found in the Bible. God showed me that the events that took place with Israel when Babylon invaded, when Nebuchadnezzar showed up at Israel's doorstep, finally after 40 years of warning by, ne by Jeremiah, it happens. And the events of the invasion were recorded in the book of Lamentations. Lamentation means crying, grieving, weeping, sadness. Jeremiah recorded the diary of how horrible it was when they were under siege and surrounded by Babylon's army. It was a year and a half that they were surrounded, and in the course of a year and a half, they ran out of water, food, the people starved, they died, they pined away, they, they, they were like concentration camp victims. A lot of people died before Nebuchadnezzar busted through the walls of Jerusalem. They were dying of hunger. Lamentations records that. It was a very sad time. There were very wealthy people in Jerusalem the day before Nebuchadnezzar showed up outside the walls, and over the course of, the year, of a year and a half, those very rich people sold off all their wealth just to get bread as they were holed up in Jerusalem. Those same events are going to happen to the United States. God revealed to me that Lamentations is going to happen to America, this similar events. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're a regular listener, you know what I'm talking about. This is not new to you. And I've gotten emails from many people that have said God has also confirmed the same thing with them. And, Doug, you've had guests who have revealed the same thing. This is not anything new. So, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Nathan, if I can say this, when I was talking to Pastor David Langford uh, this morning, he was talking about the righteous in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and talking about, uh, uh, he, he referenced one thing very specific. He said it wasn't just the, the 
when the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, it was, if you read the, the scripture very carefully, it was, and the surrounding areas, uh, or I'm paraphrasing, of course, meaning to say, at least in my view, what you're talking about is it's just not necessarily going to be America, but perhaps, you know, uh, the surrounding areas, or even, the, even if you want to take the West, um, you know, however you want to look at it, it's just not going to be confined to the United States. But I, I, I see the focus is on the United States at this point. But I, I wanted to bring that out. I thought that was important. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for sharing that. The judgment is going to be worldwide. But for me, God has called me to America, not to England or Germany. He's called me to yes. America, so that's what I focus on. But, yes, the judgment is throughout the West, and we're going to see that the European Union is, is right along with us. I don't know who's dragging who. We're dragging each other both down. But it's gonna, it's, we're both going to pay, both sides of the pond. Now, regarding America, though, the events that are going to transpire in America, ladies and gentlemen, just go to the book of Lamentations and read what it says. The same attitude that Jerusalem had, Jerusalem never thought that they could ever get invaded. They thought that they were God's great, blessed apple, and they could never have bad no one would ever touch them because of the apple in God's eye, etc. Well, America has had that same sort of arrogance. We're the the very top of the hill. No one's going to mess with America. We're tough. Well, in the same way that it happened to Israel, it's, it is happening here. If you go through Lamentations chapter 4 and, and even further on, it talks about how all the possessions of Israel became was looted by Babylon. It was stolen. Aliens occupied their houses. Their houses were taken away, and and it became very difficult for them to just exist, to get water, to get wood. It says that we gather wood at the expense of our life. They're always watching us. So oppression, police state, all that stuff is in lamentations. That's coming to America, and it has even already begun. Well, after, before Babylon showed up, Jeremiah was trying to warn them, and then finally they showed up. And in Jeremiah chapter 39, and this is the flashback I was talking about, it talks about, it tells us in verse 1, Jeremiah 39, 1, how it happened. It says, on the ninth month of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. So Babylon showed up. The watchman on the wall in Jerusalem said that we see the dust cloud on the horizon. Here they come. And the people outside the gate ran to the gate let us in, let us in. So everyone went inside Jerusalem. They raised the gate, and they they were very terrified. Here comes the army. And as the army came over the horizon, it didn't stop. They kept coming. It was hundreds, thousands of people, thousands of soldiers from Babylon came. They surrounded the city. And that's what Jeremiah 39.1 says. Well, in verse 2, it tells us how long the siege lasted. It, it, it reveals that it was about a year and a half because it says, now, in verse 1, it says the ninth year. Well, in verse 2, it says in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. So it took that long for the siege to last. And during that time, the Babylonian army built their their machine works and their trebuchets and their catapults and, and, and their battering rams, and they did a lot of carpentry, and, and they... They continued bombarding Jerusalem with, with hurling rocks and, and all of the things that they used to do in the, back in the ancient days and even in the medieval days when they would attack castles. It took a year and a half, and finally the walls were penetrated. And then in verse 3 it says, Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. And it names the different princes, Nergal, Sharizar, Samgar, Nebo, Sarshakim, Rab Saras, Nergal, Sharizer, again a second time, Rab Mag with the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. And then it goes on and explains what happened, how they came in, killed everybody, killed the, the high statesmen, the politicians, the leaders of the army. It, it, Nebuchadnezzar killed all of them, took the people prisoner, and it was the beginning of, of the next chapter of Israel's life. Israel was for then on, for the rest of the Old Testament, never, well, for a long time, at least for 70 years. Okay, so here we have the diary of how it happened. Well, this is what the Holy Spirit showed me, and, and 
I'm getting to now, Doug, when I came on your program around the time of the election, and I want to share this to just remind people that that program was not just a program to listen to two years ago, throw on the shelf and say, okay, Nathan, what else do you got? Or Doug and Joe, what else do you got? Ladies and gentlemen, I shared some things on that program that are happening now, and and I'm going to let me explain. In verse 3, it says that the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat at the middle of the gate, and it mentions their names. When we look at the United States of America, we can see a very, very similar mirrored event for the United States for an invasion of Babylon. But instead of it being a physical invasion, it's now a spiritual invasion. Because before the United States fell in 2008, if we go back 10, 20 years ago, when the United States was prosperous, it was business as usual. We had Ronald Reagan, the president. We were very prosperous, and everyone was arrogantly believing that the United States would never fall. Well, now here we are, 2014. Things are different, aren't they, Doug and, and Joe? Things are very different now. What happened? Well, what had happened was that in order for the end times to be fulfilled, we can go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and the book of Revelation tells us about this entity, this political entity that's going to exist in the end of time, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, the daughter of Babylon. There's a lot of terminology, and people have argued over who Babylon is. Well, in essence, it's not really easy to explain who Babylon is. We can't just say it's this or that because it has layers to it. The Bible mentions Babylon, daughter of Babylon, mystery Babylon, the the mystery religion. And so Babylon has a spiritual dimension to it. It has a political end-time dimension, and it also has a physical, and it has a a lot of representations. But one of the, the key characters in the end time is going to be a political entity, a power, an actual geographical location that has the spirit, and, and I want to qualify that term, the spirit of Babylon, of the, of the old Babylonian ways that have invaded the culture. And I believe at this point in time that it is the United States of America that is being invaded with the culture of Babylon. And if this is true, if I'm correct now, of course, if God shows me I'm wrong in a few years, well, then I'll repent. But for right now, it sure looks like something's going on here in America. And when we look at how America was during Ronald Reagan versus now, the culture has changed. The military morale has changed. The military momentum has changed. The political, the political forces and the political policy and the, the administrative policy from the White House has changed. Our view of the world, the way the world sees us, has changed. What we can observe now for America is something that has deteriorated into some, into, I don't know, Doug, I I have difficulty just placing a title on how how you can sum up what's going on in America, but it would fill volumes, it would fill books. We could could spend a lot of time, weeks, months, discussing all of the changes happening in America, and the reason that it's so difficult to, to see the changes and to pinpoint and itemize and describe the changes is because we are watching Bible prophecy in motion. In order for this entity to exist in the book of Revelation, the changes, the transformation, the metamorphosis has to occur somewhere in the world, and right now we see that change happening in America. Okay, now, if we were to look at how America was during the years of Ronald Reagan versus what we read in the Bible... That means that the metamorphosis has to take place somewhere between the two points. And, ladies and gentlemen, I submit this, that those changes, those transformations are happening right now. So when we look at the book of Jeremiah, chapter 39, we can see the outline of how that change is going to happen in the spiritual realm. The way it happened to Israel in the physical is now happening to America in the spiritual. So when Israel was surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar's army, the Babylonian army, in the same way America got surrounded, was surrounded by the invisible forces of spiritual Babylon and principalities that are invisible, fallen angels, demons, creatures from the underworld surrounded America, and they placed America under siege, and then at some point they walked into America. Well, a very interesting thing is found here in Jeremiah 39, and 
I shared this on your program, Doug, but I'm, I'm sharing this right now as a flashback and for those that have never heard this. When you look at Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 2, it says, In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, fourth month, ninth day of the month, city was penetrated. When we look at the United States of America, and if we take the date of September 11th, and we come forward the exact amount of time that we read in verse 2, if we, go, if we move forward 11 years, Four months and nine days from 9-11, Doug, you know where we're going with this, and you remember, we land exactly on the inauguration day of the United States, January the 20th, 2012. The exact, from, from 9-11 to inauguration day, and, and ladies and gentlemen, do the math. You can come forward, that, that, and I have an article on this, we have done programs on this, but Doug, what are the odds? I mean, first of all, let's just throw that out there. What are the odds for from 9/11 for it to exact to land exactly on the same day that Obama was inaugurated, if that's what you want to call him, the imposter Obama was inaugurated to take over America? Well, I find the odds just. I haven't done the math, but I, I would believe that there would be off the charts. Of I, I, uh, I, I agree. It's now, incredible. Now you're pulling this. Okay, you're 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 just to be clear here. Uh, so uh, I'm not. So I'm not cloudy. The eleven years, four months, and nine days between nine eleven and inauguration is consistent with the Book of Lamentations period of. Go ahead. Well, that. well actually, from nine eleven, September eleventh, coming forward, yeah. eleven years takes us to to 2011 and then you move forward at the end of the month uh, year 2011 and then you move forward well September 11th it takes us to September 11th 20 I'm sorry 2012 cuz 11 years from 2001 it takes us to September 11th the exact day 2012 okay then if we move forward 4 months from September 11th 2012 4 months takes us to January 11th, 2013. And then it says, and nine days of the, on the ninth day of the month. So from January 11th, 2013, move forward nine days, that takes us to January 20th, 2013. That's Inauguration Day. I got you. Okay, I, I apologize. Isn't that someone, uh, King Hezekiah was king uh, before the city was penetrated? Okay, Nebuchadnezzar placed uh, Zedekiah as a puppet king Eleven years, four months, and nine days before he invaded. Okay, okay, I so, got you. That's also interesting. On nine eleven, on September eleventh, where that fateful day occurred, America changed then, and that started the momentum for. And of course, we know this, right? That started every all the changes we have now. There was a spiritual thing that occurred to America. It was the beginning of something very pivotal and profound on September eleventh. It began the invasion of Babylon then where the New World Order started. Well, in the same way, Nebuchadnezzar placed Zedekiah as a puppet for his New World Order at the time. And then, as we see in verse 2, 11 years, 4 months, 9 days, the city was penetrated. So, for the United States of America, on January the 20th, we had Inauguration Day. So, how interesting is it that when we look at Obama's second term, and I, I also was on your program and I shared this, Doug, I shared that some very profound things are about to happen to America. That was back then, and we're going to see the following things occur. How did I know that? Was I psychic? No. Right here, when we look at the Scriptures, we can see something very profound. In verse 3 of Jeremiah 39, it says, it names the princes that came through the gates. Those princes that are mentioned are actual demons that exist even to this day. And we've spoken about Nurgle, the, the first guy mentioned there. He's actually mentioned twice. Nurgle is a demonic entity that exists, ladies and gentlemen. And you can go to Google and Google the word Nurgle and look in the Wikipedia page for Nurgle, and it brings up this creature that was worshipped. By the way, he was worshipped in Scripture. He was one of the gods of Babylon back then. And this creature is an actual demon entity who has a long resume of, of things that, as a demon, as a fallen angel, he does on the earth. Now, there are real demons, ladies and gentlemen, and Doug and Joe, I don't have to convince you of that. There are actual fallen spirits that exist 
There are, the Bible tells us in the, the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us, there are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world. Daniel, when he was seeking God about an answer, and the angel came and spoke to him, the angel said, I came 21 days ago, but the prince of Persia held me back, and, and then Michael had to help me fight him, and now I have left to left the battle to come and give you the message, Daniel, but now I have to go back and help Michael fight the prince of Persia. So there are actual princes over different countries and regions of the world, even right now. Well, if you go to Google and you, and you Google the word Nurgle, Nurgle is a principality, a demon. And his, his resume, and I'm not giving any accolades to these demons, ladies and gentlemen, but they exist. And the Bible tells us that there are going to be spirits deceiving the entire world in the end of time. Well, right here we can see the name of one of them. His name is, is Nurgle. And Nurgle's resume is very long, but one of the things that Nurgle was known for back then was that he was the chief of hell's secret police back then and even now. He also guards the gate to hell of the dead. But being that he was the chief of hell's secret police, that means he worked as and it, and it says right here, if you go to the information uh, on Wikipedia about Nurgle, he was an honorary spy in the service of Beelzebub, of Satan. So when we read in Jeremiah 39.3 that this prince came into, as a, a real human, uh, there was a guy named Nurgle, went into Jerusalem, and he did stuff for Nebuchadnezzar. In the same way, on January the 20th, 2012, or 2013, on the Inauguration Day, I submit this, that... The, the, the demonic entity Nurgle came into the United States of America when Obama was inaugurated. And that chief demon, principality, fallen angel, whatever you want to call him, came into the White House and, may I even, sub, may I even submit this, possessed the hierarchy of the United States of America. Not only him, but all his chiefs with him, because in verse 3 it says so. The rest of the princes of the king of Babylon came with him. So the White House was invaded by demons and fallen angels this last inauguration day. Now, what does this mean, Nathan? Now, first of all, in the natural, I know that sounds preposterous. That is insane. Let me be the first to say it in the intellect from science. Yes, it's preposterous. It's, it's goofy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but Doug and Joe, we are not limited to the intellect. And that's what I was saying earlier in the previous hour. We have to look through the other perspective. If we believe that God is real, and if we believe that the end times exist, if we believe the book of Revelation is real, if we believe the mark of the beast is going to be an event, a prophecy that will happen to the earth, that there's going to be a one world government, a false prophet, the villain, all these cast of characters in the end times, that means that we have to also believe that there are invisible forces making it happen. And I'm sharing what those forces are right now. So when we look at the United States of America, I submit this. In order for the United States to have changed and transformed from the Ronald Reagan, good, good old boy, white hat America, to what it will be in the book of Revelation, demons have to invade America and change everything. Fallen angels have to change the culture of America. Fallen angels have to influence the leadership. Fallen angels have to possess the leadership and steer the leadership to becoming fallen, away from God having a culture that is against Scripture in order to, to, to fulfill the end times. And I submit this, Doug, that is happening right now. It's, it has really been ramped up with Obama during the second inauguration. It's really got going. Now, I, I want to give a side message right now to our friends in the boiler room, uh, the secret police arm of Homeland Security that are listening to the program right now, in the NSA and the, all of those people with their headphones on listening to our discussion right now, Doug and Joe. Oh, Gentlemen, please do, Nathan. Those of you working for Homeland Security, those of you that are working for the New World Order, your paycheck just says the United States government, United States Treasury, and, and, and it may feel like a noble thing. You're doing a good thing. But may I please share this with you? The United States is fallen. The United States is fulfilling end-time Bible prophecy, and if you are working in the boiler room of the spy agency, you are working for the minions of Satan. You are working for, uh, let me be a little bit more blunt, for the principalities that are going to change America into a communistic, social, 
Marxist police state of dictatorship, oppression, banana republic, et cetera, et cetera, of oppression and slavery that's coming to America. You know what you're doing, and I want to just challenge you guys to repent and to think your occupation, because it's your job description, and is your paycheck worth your eternal life? And I just want to have that on the table, Doug. Those guys are out there. I know they're listening. Right now, we are seeing America turn into a Marxist, communistic country, and the driving forces behind this are demonic elements. Nurgle is one of these creatures, and Nurgle is the chief of Hell's Secret Police. When he came through on Inauguration Day, since he is a chief of Hell's Secret Police, he has been this for, at this for a while. He has been at this for the entire existence of mankind on Earth. He has been involved in this during the Nazi era. He was involved in this during some of the other dictatorship regimes of, of days gone by that we can look in history, recent and far. Satan has used the same cast of characters, the same demons. They're very good at, at twisting the philosophy and the culture and the political direction of countries and of leadership, of kings, uh, of presidents, to become oppressive. They're very good at using deception. They're very good at making the king think it's his idea. Most of these kings that become dictators do not probably know that they're under the control of demons. They probably don't. Some maybe, some but others just think it's their idea. They think they're just smart. They think that it's a good opportunity for them to prosper and have some power while they're on earth. Mr. Obama is deceived. He is under a spell. And Nurgle has Obama under a spell. And since he was the chief of hell's secret police, he has a lot of great ideas that have to do with being a secret police person or to have secret police policies that are oppressive. This is why we have watched since the inauguration day, the recent inauguration of Obama, America turn into – now, Doug, let's just go back almost two years, or it's not even been two years, or has it? Oh, some change? Look at the changes that have to do with spying, secret police stuff, the NSA, the all of these – it's now out in the open. Utah has this big boiler room being built right now so they can spy on us. We have the drones flying over us. They're listening to our phone calls. They're able to get into our computers, listen to our phone calls. The, our cell phones dredge every few days reveals how they're listening to the, all of us, even people in, in, on other, in other countries, to other diplomats. They're spying on everyone. The United States is now the spy agency. We are the KGB. And I know people like to point fingers at Russia and say it's them. No, ladies and gentlemen, the United States has taken on a new, a new metamorphosis. They have been transformed. They are now the spires of the world. Let's just be honest here. This thing has, has changed and bulldozed in such a quick fashion. It's become a tsunami that from 2008 to now, Doug, it's night and day. And especially since the inauguration of 2012, it has really taken hold. Now, for the people that are just watching this happen, how many stop to consider that there's a spiritual element behind the scenes? How many stop to consider that Valerie Jarrett is demon-possessed and that Nurgle and his chiefs have also, she's become a Hilton for them, the Holiday Inn for them. All these people that are part of Obama's administration, let me just say it bluntly, Doug, they are demon-possessed or oppressed or influenced or they become marionette puppets of demonic forces. It is too obvious. When we have the events happening right now that are destroying our once beloved nation of America, when the policies are happening before our eyes in every category, social, political, in the, in economic, academic, I mean, the list goes on. We are watching every category of America be destroyed right now before our eyes and the big question that a lot of us ask when we read the headlines on drudge every day is who why isn't anyone doing something why isn't boehner doing something where are the republicans where's the where are the where's the outcry where is it well it's not happening because this is a spiritual tsunami and demonic forces are at this thing it is not just a spiritual or uh, i'm sorry a political event occurring it is spiritual. So Nurgle is influencing the
the planet right now. Now, I have something I want to share. Um, if you go to my website, Doug, I don't know if you have yet. I placed some notes there. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would take the time, if you have access to the Internet, please go to watchmanscry.com. And on the very top of the right side of the page, it says, I'm going to be on Hagman and Hagman. It says notes, show notes. Please click the link of notes, Doug and Joe. I don't know if you've been there yet, but I have some things that I want to talk about now. And, ladies and gentlemen, I have to, to mention these things. I want to preface what I'm about to say. I'm going to, I see we're getting close to the top of the hour. I'm going to talk about some very disturbing things going on. These demons that are coming through America are influencing everybody. And the most disturbing thing about this is that the majority of the population does not know that they are being influenced with demonic invasion. Amen, they do not brother. Know this. It, you're exactly correct. Nathan, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm on your page, watchmanscry.com, and folks, you can go to uh, in the event uh, that escapes your memory, you can go to homelandsecurityus.com, click on the right-hand side, uh, links directly to Washington's Cry. Um, I'm looking at your page, Nathan. I'm, I'm trying to find that which you referenced at the top right, you said? Yeah, on the top right it says Nathan on Hagman and Hagman. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe I'm uh, I'm missing it well, here. You might have to refresh huh. your page. If you hold control oh, here F5, we go. it'll refresh it. There we go. I yep yep that's what happened. Okay. Okay. Control F five. If some of you have been there, it'll refresh it. Okay. okay. So you see well, show notes. Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now, I want to yep. talk about the invasion happening right now, and I'm also going to talk about the spiritual invasion. Now, I've prefaced everything up to this point by saying that we are under a spiritual invasion. I've been on the show enough times, Doug, to to document that the spiritual invasion going on in the United States of America and in the West and in the world has had the participation of individuals who think that this is a good thing. We have individuals who are part of the Illuminati, Luciferians, Satanists, pagans, witches, etc., who have taken part in different ritualistic ceremonies, who have opened spiritual porter, portals in their ceremonies. And, and in their ceremonies, they cause the portals to be open. A lot of these things have taken place in the last few years. I've been on your program. We've talked about it, how the shamans went across America, and they opened portals across the country with the crystal skulls. Uh, we've talked about how during the Olympic ceremony, it was a ritual to open portals. And if you go to the page right now, it says there's an invasion occurring right now. Is this the invasion, the illegals from the south? Or is it something else, like demons? Over the past few years, we have been experiencing an ongoing spiritual invasion. I just prefaced with Jeremiah 39. We also saw what happened in the Olympic ritual. And, Doug, you remember that? You see the images of when the, in the actual Olympic ceremony, in the opening ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, the 2012 Olympics, they brought in Gastonbury Tour. They recreated an area of England where it's used by the pagans to conduct ritualistic ceremonies where they contact demons, etc., where they brought in a recreation of that location, and they placed it on the field of the Olympic opening ceremony, and then they recreated an actual ritual where they welcomed demons from the underworld, and they placed an oak tree on top of the hill. The hill, the tree rose up, and all of these people poured out from under the hill. Those people pouring out represented demons coming from the underworld. We talked about it several years ago, Doug. You remember? Right? It's on record. I, yep, yep. They, they beat the drums during this, this event. The, a band who was called Pandemonium, which means uh, the capital of hell, played during the Olympics, and they beat drums as the invasion happened. And then all of the member nations that showed up at the Olympics, which was the majority of the world except three, Vatican was one of them, showed up, those member nations that showed up and the participants, in my opinion, got slimed with this ritual and they took it back home to their perspective areas of the world. That's why I agree with you, Doug, it's worldwide. This thing was then spread throughout the world. That was one opening of portals. The portals are continuing to be open in different ways. The Olympic ceremony was one of them. 
But there was another event that occurred in 2008 during the summer where there was a, a revival ceremony that took place in the summer of 2008 where a Canadian evangelist went down to Lakeland, Florida. His name was Todd Bentley, and he showed up, and he tatted up his whole body, and he was having a quote-unquote supernatural revival. During that segment of time when he was having those revivals, I watched on YouTube, God TV, televised them every night for three months, and pastors throughout the country filled up their vans from, from California, Seattle, New York, and they drove to Lakeland, Florida, and they participated in Todd Bentley's ritualistic ceremony where Todd Bentley, and let me just be blunt with this, ladies and gentlemen, Todd Bentley was a fraud, he was an imposter, and he represented Satan. He placed tattoos on himself where he says that an angel named Emma spoke to him every night in his motel room and gave him the sermon for the next day, and he tattooed Emma the angel on his body. Well, it turns out that Emma is a demon, but Todd Bentley would share with these individuals every day in the revival that Emma was, was showing them what to talk about and what to share. And over the course of three months, this thing went viral. I don't know if you folks remember this, Doug and Joe. I don't know if you remember. But at the end of every one of his, his sermons, he said, everyone get in line. I'm going to lay hands on you, and I'm going to impart the fire on you. Well, what he was actually doing was imparting the slime of demonic plague and pestilence on Christians through the Kundalini, Kundalini spirit, because when he would touch the people, they would fall on the ground and start screaming that they were on fire and writhing like snakes. And it was a demonic, very disturbing, profound event that took place in the church during the summer of 2008. That was right before the crash of September. So for three months, the demons started working on the church. And I was very disappointed, and to this day I'm still disappointed with the pastors across America who had the lack of discernment or no discernment to allow their, their members to be taken to this false prophet, demon-possessed false prophet, and allow their members to get slimed with an impartation from hell. And then those same people came back home and they started spreading the pestilence amongst their congregations and the, their bodies, their, their churches. Now, when that happened, at that time, Tattoos in the church were not very welcomed. And this is what I need to talk about, Joe and Doug. And ladies and gentlemen, if this offends you, what I'm going to share right here, please hear my heart. I'm not doing this to throw rocks, to be self-righteous, or to condemn you. I'm just here to tell the truth. I am a watchman of God, and I'm here to share that we're in a spiritual battle. And those that want to survive the end-time deception must do everything they can to have the wisdom to see above the lie and the deception. No when Todd Bentley showed up... Sorry, no disclaimers necessary. You just go. Okay. When Todd Bentley showed up, it was an anathema to have tats in the church for most people. They, they questioned it, they struggled with it, but it wasn't really accepted. Todd Bentley showed up for nine months, laid hands on thousands of people, and they all went home all across the country. And, since two th and then a month later, by the way, it got exposed that the entire time Todd Bentley was having his revival services, he was also having an affair. He was shacked up with one of his helpers who every night went to his hotel room and they committed adultery and committed sin and, and committed fornication while he was, during the, the evenings, sharing that he was an evangelist for God. So he was a fraud, an adulterer. And then he laid hands on people. The Bible is very, very clear. It says, do not lay hands on any man suddenly. That's in the Scripture. It says, know those who labor among you. The Bible is very clear that transference can happen when we lay hands on someone and pray for them. Here's where the spiritual gets involved. If we look back at the Old Testament, Aaron, the high priest of Israel, once a year laid hands on the, the, two, the two goats for the sacrifice, and he confessed the sins of Israel. That was a symbolic event where the sins were then transferred through his arms into the goats. And then he sacrificed one, and the other one was a scapegoat. It, it was let loose in the wilderness. But a transference of sin occurred, even for the high priest of Israel. 
If we move forward, that same thing happens. We lay hands on people for healing, but the Bible is very clear. Be careful who you lay hands on or who you let lay hands on you. Well, unfortunately, most of the church during this season in 2008 was not careful, and Todd Bentley, the adulterer and demon-possessed person, laid hands on thousands of people and transferred demonic sludge. That demonic sludge then went out throughout the country. And since then, since it was exposed who he was in August of 2008, the following month, the crash of 2008 happened. And that began this downward, this very horrible downward economic crisis that, the, that America has not recovered yet. That started the chain reaction of what we're in now. But it began with a spiritual judgment, ladies and gentlemen. What is going on right now in the United States of America is not only an economic crisis. It is spiritual, meaning that we need to look at it through a different lens. So I'm mentioning this, Joe and Doug, for a reason, because the people need to know that this thing is taking over America like a tsunami. Over the last few weeks, God has given me two prophetic dreams where I saw more waves of, of a tsunami, and the only people that are going to survive are those that find the rock, the mountain of God, and, see, and find shelter in the high place with God. On the other side of the hour, I'm going to talk about that. I see what time it is, uh, Doug and Joe, and I'm going to finish what I'm talking to, or what I'm talking about right now, and we're going to go into the demonic invasion that is occurring right now. What we see happening from the south is a representation of what's really going on in the spiritual realm. When we look at the trains and see those illegals from Central America and Mexico, each one of those is really a representation of demons that are coming into America. America is being invaded right now by demonic forces, and because that's going to happen, the zombie quote-unquote apocalypse is coming, and it's going to be a very dark time, Joe and Doug, and I'm going to talk about that on the other side of the hour. Sounds good, Nathan. And, and folks, um, uh, we do have linked directly to Nathan's show notes. If you go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, just simply look on the right-hand side under uh, Thursday night on the Hagman Hagman Report, a direct link to Nathan's show notes. And i got to tell you something, um, pretty disturbing images there. Uh, venture at your own risk. That's watchmanscry.com. And, of course, he goes over the um, uh, from the Olympics to the opening, the invasion of demons from the underworld. The oak tree rose and opened a portal to hell, and it's a worldwide summoning. And then, of course, he goes into uh, the uh, infusion uh, into Christianity. And I also have to say this. Um, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what the renegade in chief, Barack Hussein Obama, carries in his pocket. The uh, talisman, of course, um, uh, he carries at least a pocket full of different talismen. Perhaps one of the best known carried by the renegade in chief is a lucky charm or locket for an Indian Lord, or for Indian Lord uh, Hanuman. It's an idol best known by, well, known by several names, actually, including the monkey god, the redeemer, and other so-called omnipotent names in the Hindu world. Isn't that interesting? And uh, he was given this idol to carry with him, as he does uh, as a devotee of this monkey God. Now, isn't that interesting? Folks, you're listening to a very special Thursday edition with our very special guest, Mr. Nathan Leal, on this 17th day of July 2014, 21 years ago, the downing of PWA Flight 800. Today, the downing of a Malaysian airliner. Hmm. Interesting. Get hey, right And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the third and final hour of this Thursday, July 17th edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report with our special guest, Mr. Nathan Leal. His website is Watchman's Cry, I'm sorry, yeah, Watchman'sCry.com, Watchman'sCry.com. And if you want to go over the show notes for tonight, on the right-hand side, under the uh, Nathan on Hagman and Hagman, there is a link to notes, or go to HomelandSecurityUS.com, 
and on the right hand side under guests tonight you can link directly to that site uh, as well Nathan uh, we're in our third and final hour and we'll let you pick up where you left off all right well um, Doug and Joe gentlemen ladies and gentlemen this topic I know is not an easy topic to to discuss because there are people that are very adamant and passionate about this topic so I'm a I want to address this from the standpoint of the spiritual. If you find yourself getting mad with what I share, please at least take the time to digest it and take it to God. And I want to challenge, if, this, if you really have a struggle with this, I want to challenge you to, to do your own research. Do some Googling because, again, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is very clear. In the end of days, God says because people do, do not have a love for the truth he will send a delusion the delusion is going to envelop the entire world and it's going to convince most of the world to fall for the the lies of satan now right now as i've, I've been sharing the united states is under the attack of spiritual forces the invisible demons from babylon are invading america and it's not something that's going to happen. This thing has already been in motion for a while now. And we're going to see news story after news story that are just so bizarre, make no sense. They will frustrate. They will confuse. They will. There's a lot of emotions that already I'm finding myself going through when I read just what's going on right now. Doug, I mean, this invasion from the South makes no sense. It, it absolutely it boggles the mind. I don't get it, and the average person, if I'm feeling this way, I'm sure you are. There's a frustration involved. There's a tendency to want to be mad, anger, do something, rise up, etc. But it makes absolutely no sense unless we look at it from the spiritual. Now, as the arrival of Babylon's influence comes in, it's going to have a multifaceted effect on the people. And this has to be made very clear. Most people, as it arrives, are going to grasp it, and they're going to seize it. They're going to love it because they're going to be deceived by it. Most are not going to notice that Babylon's poison is going to infect them or that it, that it is infecting them. And the few that do will try their best to separate and inoculate themselves from the poison, but where do you go for information to help you and support you with that? How, how do you overcome this? There. And that's why I want to talk about this right now. Babylon's poison is very real. And part of the poison, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's influencing the very culture of the United States, of the land. And also, this is, this is what it's doing. And this is the part that I'm very concerned about, Doug and Joe. Right now we are seeing a dry run to change the popular opinion and the way that people process certain things so that they will receive and accept the mark of the beast when it arrives. The, the mark of the beast will not just arrive and shock everyone, and then people will say, huh, well, you know what, family meetings, should we or shouldn't we? No. When the mark of the beast shows up, it's going to sound like such a great idea. It, it's going to be very successful when it arrives because it's going to have a spiritual deception behind it. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, please think of this. It's going to be spiritual, meaning that there's going to be a demonic force behind the mark of the beast, and there's going to be a corporate psychological campaign from hell itself so that people will accept it. And that campaign, may I submit this, is happening now. Demons are already at work with the campaign for the mark of the beast. And right now demons are whispering and they're bombarding the political leadership to begin working on this thing and the principalities and the creatures that I mentioned that have invaded America, that have come from below the earth, are right now recruiting and promoting the mark of the beast. Now, 20 years ago when I was a new Christian and I thought of the time when the mark of the beast would arrive, I, I assumed back then that most people would fight it, abhor it, fear it, even non-Christians. There's no way I'm taking it, I'll die. Well, Back then, I never thought about the scenario like I'm seeing it now. I, I did not see it then like I see it now. Ladies and gentlemen, now, 
Please hear me. And this is why I believe that most Christians are going to have no problem with the mark when it's unveiled. Why? It's because they are in the church. There is a spiritual force where people are embracing the spirit behind the mark right now. And many so-called remnant people are already under its spell. Doug, people that listen to your show who know about the New World Order and say that it won't happen to them, they're not going to put up with it, etc. This is the part that's difficult. When people are spiritually deceived, do they really know it? Do they know that their thought pattern is not their own thoughts, but is an influence from a whispering of a, a spirit? Let me share uh, real quickly. Peter, when we look at the scriptures, Jesus said, Peter, who do they say I am? Peter said, you are the, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, heaven and earth has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my father in heaven. Okay, Peter was under the Holy Ghost anointing to say that. But within a few verses, in the same portion of the Bible, Peter is saying, Jesus, you're not going to die. No, you're not going to go to the cross and what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. So in the course of several verses, Peter went from knowing the voice of God to thinking it was his own thoughts when it was Satan. And Jesus rebuked it. So if it could happen to Peter while he's in the presence of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, it could happen to any one of us. We have to be on guard. We have to do everything we can to be vigilant against the influence of Satan. Now, please hear me. I'm not here to rah-rah the latest New World Order talking point or fad. I'm here to stir up God's people, to try to wake up some of God's people. So here's what's going on. The spirit behind the coming mark of the beast is now working throughout the world. Now, how do I know this? Very simple. And I, and I challenge anyone to do this, Doug and Joe. Just go to your neighborhood Walmart, and since it's summer, it'll be easier because people are hot and they're wearing shorts and tank tops. Go to your neighborhood Walmart and check out everybody. Look at the people. Look at the shoppers. When I go to the Walmart in Spokane, I, I was there a few days ago with my wife. I could not believe my surroundings because I, I was with my wife, and, and we were kind of whispering to each other, okay, another one, okay, one, two, three, four, five. It was when we looked at ten people, every one of those people, every one of them, Young, old, millennials, and you will see this yourself if you go to Walmart. Middle age, skinny, obese. Here's the deal, folks. They all have tats. All of them. Hey. Now, yep. And Nathan, if I can just add something here, um, I don't want to take, take again take guy for stride, but uh, as a father with children, I had uh, told my my young uh, daughter and my son. Uh, I looked at. I'm looking at Joe now. He's got no tattoos. I said I would meet you at the door with an electric sander if you walk through my door with a tattoo. I just want to just you know look tattoos. You're absolutely correct because of the well, Nathan. I, you could say it better than I can, but isn't that the uh, wearing down, so to speak, of uh, uh, the acclimation? of taking the mark, perhaps? Exactly. And see, Satan's, they're, they have crafty genius. They have evil genius. They know what they're doing. They, they've changed societies. This isn't the first time. That this isn't their first rodeo. They know how to convince people to accept the next part of their plan. They have the script. It's all laid out. They have their outline, the template. And I, I don't participate in the demonic boardroom meetings, but if the mark of the beast is, is line item 10, they're going to have assignments from lines one through nine to get the people ready for that. And I submit this, ladies and gentlemen, in plain English, let me say this. The mark of the beast is going to be powered by demonic forces, and it's now steering society in the first measures to accept it. Why? Because since 2008, we have seen, and I'm not saying it was just from the Lakeland Revival, but I find it interesting that since 2008, I have watched in bewilderment and disappointment and name the emotion, but I've been very frustrated as I see this trend not just be a constant trend, but this thing has become a frenzied tsunami of momentum. In a time when this economy has people barely surviving, they're on food stamps, they don't have enough money for this or that, but they have 
enough money when they're broke, they're on unemployment, EBT cards, but they still are able to sacrifice to get that tat. And tattoos aren't cheap. And Nathan and Leah, I wonder how many people right now have your arms crossed and you're disturbed on what I'm saying. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to throw rocks at you. I'm bringing another perspective to this thing. When we look at the, the background of this trend, of this, this practice, when we look at the individuals throughout the world, throughout planet Earth who take part in this practice, we can see that, for example, we look at the invasion taking place at the top of the page. I have the picture of the, the people on top of the train. But inside, included with those individuals, are gang members, Doug, and, and we have seen the stories already come out. MS-13 is invading America right now. and They're coming in clandestine. They're trying to sneak in, but they're going to come in, and it's going to start in the border states, and these gang members are demon-possessed. They are murderers. They are hatchet men. They kill. They dismember. They behead. Their chosen weapon is a machete. These people don't care about life. They're demon-possessed. They just care about their, their cause, which is dark. I don't want to waste time on MS-13, but that's one gang. There are other ones, but MS-13 has tats to show that they're killers. The incarcerated ones in prison have tats to show what they've done, how many they've killed. The prisoners use tats to show their sins and their iniquities. Satanists and pagans use tats to remind their flesh who they serve. And I can go on, but this trend is placing a huge time stamp on Western society to show us where we really are right now, how, how close we are to the end time clock, because Western society is under a spell right now where this trend is taking over so many people. And so many people will argue for it. So many people will justify it, including Christians, and they will excuse it that if it's their testimony for Jesus and it's their witness for Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, if my words are offensive, I am sorry. But the pulpits of America are too wimpy to say something about this. And Doug and Joe, they have no backbone. I'm watching denominational churches from all, all over the country. I'm, I'm watching the young generation share each other's tats. I've seen this. I, I see it here in my local town. Now, Imagine that, ladies and gentlemen, where kids go to church, they go to youth group, where they assemble the college and career, the young people assemble at church, and they share their latest <laughs> tattoo with one another at church. Now, right now, some of you are probably saying amen, or some of you might, might may be saying, oh, Doug, cut his microphone. But, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say this, because <laughs> this shows where we are. Now, granted, in times past, World War II, a tattoo was a little symbol of endearment, like a Popeye anchor to show the band of brotherhood. It was a little thing, and it stayed like that. But that's not what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the frenzied momentum of this trend. It's a huge indicator of where we are, Doug and Joe. They're, Mom and Dad, please hear me. There are spiritual laws that exist. And when we look at the nation of Israel who took part in idolatry and Baal worship, and they did things that were against the Bible. When mom and dad did it a little bit, and they dabbled with it, the children went for it. And the trend of, of human nature is whatever mom and dad mess with, the kids are going to go crazy with. And this is the thing I have to, that I'm concerned about, Doug. If you go to my website, and of course, I'm, thank you for qualifying. Look at your, uh, be careful. Use discretion, warn the people. But if you look at the tattoos that I have, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to my website of show notes, I have placed images from a conference that w recently took place in Venezuela, down in middle America. And down there, if you look at those people, <laughs> Doug, those people look, the tatted people look scary. It, the, the painted men, and it's not just the Popeye anchor on these people. They not only tattooed a few things on their arms and legs, they look like some of the heathenistic type scary individuals that the conquistadors met when they, they saw the Mayans for the first time. The conquistadors didn't know what to make of the tats on the Mayans. History has shown that the barbarism that has been a part of 
humanity in the past where people were cannibals and they worshipped Satan and did voodoo. This is how they looked. This is how they adorned their bodies. It wasn't just tats. That wasn't enough. It became cutting their flesh. It became these these things that they placed in their ears, these, I don't know, gauges or whatever you call them in the ears, through the nose, through the cheeks. And if you look at these individuals, Doug, can you imagine one of these guys being behind a pulpit and saying, uh, today's guest speaker is so-and-so, he has a sermon for us. Well, you know, even though, uh, Nathan, we should not judge people by their appearance, this is a self-induced um uh, th- 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 this has nothing to do with one's appearance as God has made us. You know, uh, this is this is actually um, uh, well beyond that. And yes, you know, looking at this, um, how, how can you take any? How can any rational, sane human being take somebody that appears like those images that you have? Very disturbing, by the way. Um. What's the message here, Nathan? I, I mean, it, it, to me, it's got to be it's got to be demonic. There are so many layers to this, and to the individual who's a Christian and says it's just good, I'm a, I'm a witness for Jesus. My friend, please just hear me out with what I'm going to share right here. This practice is a part of the barbaric nature of heathenistic paganism, where you have witches, Satanists, warlocks, who include this as part of their religion. And it doesn't stop there, because as it gravitates and goes into body mutilation and piercing, and I have some images here where there's metal. If you don't see these images, ladies and gentlemen, there's metal going through cheeks and tongues. They have forked tongues. Some of the people file their teeth to look like vampires. They're putting contact lenses to look like reptilians. They're placing under their skin, Teflon appendages to, so that they look like they have horns to, to look like devils. And then, on top of that, at this conference in Venezuela, you folks remember the movie The Man Called Horse? Doug, you remember that way back when? Man oh, Called Horse? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and in that, oh, Richard Harris was, they placed, they, they pierced his chest and they raised him up. It was, it's one of those rituals that Native Americans do where they suspend people through their skin, with, with uh, hooks through their skin, and they elevated him, and it was part of the ritual. Well, as part of the display of, of this practice, the, these tattooed people in Venezuela also did, and the, the bottom pages, I just want to warn you, if you don't want to go that far and, and, and see it, then don't go to the bottom of the page. But I have included this because I am showing, ladies and gentlemen, Doug and Joe, I am showing where we're headed. This practice of whatever you want to call it, is going to flood America, where young people are going to pierce themselves with hooks and elevate themselves just like you see in these images, because these individuals come from Venezuela, and right now they are invading the country. The demon influence that they have, where they are taking part in this mutilation that that is satanic, that is pagan, and it's dark, it's not just an intellectual event here. This is a spiritual event ritualistic thing that they're doing those people are coming across the border right now so when we saw going backwards at the olympic ceremony the people that represented demons coming out of the earth flooding the earth through the portals those demons are in some nations stronger than in other nations but the end game is going to be that those voodoo spirits those 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 spirits of the occult of satanism Right now they're already in America, but we are going to see an influx, influx of these people that are demon-possessed. It's going to boggle the mind. And mom and dad, this is what I was getting to. Right now you may say, I got a tattoo, be a witness for Jesus. Look, it's right here on my arm. It's a verse. Isn't that cute? But you still display your flesh to them when you lose it and when you, you're, you haven't been prayed up. You, you still act like you're not supposed to. Our Witness for Jesus is not by what we paint on our skin. That's the surface. Our witness for Jesus is what's com- what comes out of our heart in the fruit, the way we act, the way we behave, the way we respond, the way that we help others, etc., etc. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. God does not need us to, to paint a little verse on us to, to show 
that we love Jesus because in, eventually that verse is going to be hypocritical when we fail. So God doesn't need you to do that. What your children need from you is to behave right and to be a mom and dad that's righteous because the the flip side of what's going on right now for the parents that go to church that are tatting themselves, the second generation is going to do what we have in these images. That's what I'm getting at. Spirit that is behind the little whispering, oh, it's for Jesus. See, that's how Satan does it. He starts out with a little deception, but the children are the ones that pay the price when they when they go even 200, 300, 500%. Well, mom did it, so and dad did it. I'm just going to do it a little more. My friends did this. Well, isn't it cool to, to put a bone through my nose? What's wrong with a hook through my chest? What's wrong with cutting myself? And this is what I was going to share, Doug and Joe. When a person gets a tattoo, they're shedding their blood. In the Old Testament, God was very clear. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God is very clear. Do not eat blood. God is very clear that we should not eat things that are sacrificed to idols, that their blood was shed to idols. There is a spiritual event that occurs when it has to do with the sacrifice of blood or the involvement of blood that is very, very powerful to the forces of darkness. That's why Jesus shed his blood. He was the Lamb of God. But that is also why Satanists and witches and warlocks and, and all that group of individuals have bloodletting and drinking of blood and consumption of blood as a part of their ceremonies because it empowers them. It energizes them with spiritual energy. It, it summons demonic forces that are very powerful when blood gets involved. Now... When, a, when a, an individual gets a tattoo and they're shedding their blood to place the image on their skin, blood is being shed by another person, the tattoo artist. Now, that tattoo artist, the day before, placed tattoos on who knows who. But for the most, most likely, it was some, someone that's involved in witchcraft or paganism or Satanism, and he cut into their skin with that tattoo gun and he shed their blood. The tattoo gun got blood on it from a demon-possessed person. And then that same tattoo gun, yeah, it has another needle, or they claim it does, is used on Christians to have a verse for God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please think about this. Going to a shrine to Satan, going to a shrine that has artwork that is devoted to Satan, that is that acknowledges satanic forces and demons and witches and, and bones and death, they're on the wall. When you go into a tattoo parlor, all the images of Satan and death, it's an idol to Baal. It's an idol to the forces of Babylon. There are demons in a tattoo parlor. They love it. They, they, they stay there. They love it to influence. I'm going into the spiritual aspect. When a person sheds blood, when they're getting a tattoo, Doug and Joe, something happens in the invisible realm. And the invisible impartation that they might not know about can influence them. How do they know that they're leaving the same way they arrived? How do they know that they are not leaving with uh, a little, with uh, someone that didn't pay the ticket to be a part of them, with, with, with someone that's grabbing on a, a free ride? Demons I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. Also, let me say this. As I said before in, in the previous hour, the Bible is very specific. Do not lay hands on anyone suddenly. Do not let people touch you that may be demonically influenced or possessed. You do not let possessed people pray for you. Todd Bentley laid hands on people and imparted spiritual forces, and the people got slimed. The Bible is very clear that transference happens through our hands. The tattoo artist is touching the person getting the tattoo. He is transferring all the slime that he has been collecting the day before or weeks before, etc. Also, let me say this. Right now in these end times, there is a, a epidemic, an, addiction, an addictive type epidemic, stronghold, chains, horrible strongholds, very dark part of people's lives where they are addicted to sexual sin. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. To pornography, to lust. Why is that happening? It's because there are demonic elements of lust that have been released all over Babylon. 
It's on, on, on the TV, on the news, on the Internet, etc. And there are Christians that hate this bondage. I get emails from people, Doug, from people that are in this bondage, and they hate it. They want to be free from it. And I, I write letters, I pray for them, I encourage them. But it is a bondage that is rooted in different areas of their life. And if people really took the time to take inventory of where they go, what they do, what's in their house, the things they take part in, the things they are, are participating in, they might find that they have open doors to their life that are making it easy for the demonic spirits of lust to invade their household. If they were to address these things and really get the upper hand, which takes study, which takes effort, which takes getting to the Word, which takes prayer, then they might find that there are parts of their lives that are an open door to Satan. Now, when we look at a tattoo artist, we're all adults here, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a grown-up, you know this, okay? So let's not pretend, let's not beat around the bush, and let's not try to whitewash it. Because of the trend today with tattoos, tattoos have become a sensual thing where nothing is sacred, no holds bars, no hold, there are no holds barred from the people who are getting tats. They are getting them throughout their bodies, including their genitals and in their private parts. Girls go into tattoo parlors and drop their pants and allow the artist to decorate them. Let's be honest here. That tattoo artist has a spirit of lust, and he's enjoying what he's doing. Let's not pretend here, ladies and gentlemen. It, it, when it, you're it, you enjoying know, Nathan, doing that, Nathan, if I can just jump in here, the Illuminati. Look, they use in the Satanists and Luciferians. Make no mistake, and I agree with you on this because they they use uh, tattoos as a method of of branding, and um, it, it's uh, associated with the sex slavery market. If you look at the porn movies, per, please don't, but. Um, it's well known in the porn industry, and you can find this out. You can you can uh, do research on this, where many of the female uh, actresses in the pornographic movies have tattoos of Illuminati symbols, and also uh, Justin Bieber, by the way, got a tattoo apparently of Moloch on his arm. But the primary purpose here, I think, what you're saying, and, and thank you for allowing me to jump in here, is is the uh, the preparation for the average person, the general public, for this these um, uh, this branding in, in preparation for implants, RFID implants, or even tattoo implants. Um, this is why they, they're promoting, uh, pr- promoting tattoos. And, of course, this, this is all uh, spelled out through uh, the transhumanistic agenda. And uh, it, 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 uh, I just have to say this. I mean, so you're right on the money with this. It, it's, and pardon the pun, but this is more than skin deep. Go ahead. Thank you, Doug. And again, ladies and gentlemen, I know this is not pleasant to hear, but I am. I just want the people to know. See the the Christians that say I want to get a, a tattoo of Jesus. That's all they think about, and they're looking at the end result, but they're not looking behind the scenes of where they're going. They're going to the Roach Motel, first of all, the demonic Roach Motel. And that tattoo artist, let me be blunt, ladies and gentlemen, has the body says you cannot be joined to God and be joined to a prostitute. When a, a, a person commits adultery with a prostitute, he is joined to the prostitute. The demonic spirit of lust in the prostitute slimes the person that is joined to the prostitute. And then he leaves, and then for the remainder of his life, unless he gets victory over it, he has that lustful demon that has now been welcomed into his life. The tattoo artist who is joined because he's shedding blood with his customers, he's joined with them. And if he's doing tats in in sexual places, parts of the body, he is joined with them. And since he is causing them to shed blood, there is something, ladies uh, ladies and gentlemen, where bloodletting is taking place and spiritual elements are being involved that are very powerful, more powerful than most people take into account. So that slime of those demonic elements then get into the tattoo artist, on him, through him, hover around him, and when the Christian comes in and says, hey, put um, born again on me, the tattoo artist says, okay, and they might talk about God, and and then the person leaves saying, look what I did for Jesus. They do not take into account everything I just mentioned. But ladies and gentlemen, there is more to it. 
That's why the blood brotherhood type ritualistic things that we know about from Native American culture, they both cut their arms and rub the arms together in blood. They are joined together in blood. This is part of the occultic barbarism that is against the Scripture. And we can go into the Scripture. The, the Bible prohibits this. The Bible says to not mark yourself with, with, don't print into your bodies like the Egyptians did. And, you know, Doug, I was thinking about that. Moses wrote that in Leviticus. Do not print your, your, your body. And I have a feeling that because now they've, looked at the mummies of Ramses and the Egyptian pharaohs, they had tats on them. I wonder if the children of Israel, who were influenced by Egypt when they left Egypt, if some of them already had tats, and God was telling them, stop it, no more. I'm wondering if God was trying to put a stop to it, and of course he said in the new land where you go, do not do it, because there are things involved. Do not follow the ways of Baal, the ways in this new land you're going there's a, a, a whole study that goes behind this. And, ladies and gentlemen, I want to challenge you, and that's what I was saying earlier. Instead of just getting mad at me and crossing your arms and saying, I'm never listening to Nathan again because he said this, I'm saying this for your spiritual health and well-being, ladies and gentlemen. So please hear that. I'm not saying it to throw rocks at you. Because, Doug, amen. Indeed, you are correct. The... The open door now that is occurring in the church, and this thing is, is taking a whole new dimension. It's, it's a whole new, new, it's taking a life of its own, tats in the church. I, I was, when I was doing research for this, I brought, uh, in Google, it brought up on, from the pulpit, on the stage, a church actually had a tattoo artist who called himself a Christian tattoo artist, and I don't have a link here, you can Google it, but he asked for a volunteer in the audience, and an audience came on the stage, and he tatted the, a verse for God in front of everybody to show how it's artistic and, and it's a good witness for God during a church service. So we have moved now from how it was questionable and anathema in the eyes of many to now it's acceptable. How did that happen so quick? Why did it happen? Is it harmless? Many people who do not look at the spiritual dimension will say, yes, it's harmless, Nathan. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that the mark of the beast is coming. So when the mark comes, Satan knows that he has to get people thinking to, that it's okay to accept tattoos. And, if, and by the way, Doug, what if the, the mark of the beast involves a barcode that looks like a tat? What if it does? I know a lot of people talk about the chip and all that. What if it's both? But what if it does involve something cool? What if it's a logo that the people like? Well, the mark, the mark of the beast, you have a choice. You can get this or, or that. We have one here with a lion, and here's some with flowers, but it's the mark of the beast, and you can pick from the top ten. Which one do you want, Mom and Dad? And they're going to make it fun. They're going to make it cool. And since most people are now being brainwashed to accept tests, this is what I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen. We are seeing the preliminary cultural acceptance of the mark of the beast, and it's happening right now before our eyes, and most people don't get it. Pastors from churches are not putting the two things together. They don't get it, and now they're accepting it. They're not questioning it. They're not challenging their body to think, think twice about it. Doug, we have right now a, a project from, from the underworld to, to change the thinking of the church, and it's having a great success, unfortunately. You, you know, back in the year 2000, it seems like so long ago, but uh, 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 there was a uh, doctor by the name of Keith Bolton, the chief technology officer at Applied the Digital Systems, who said at a meeting in uh, 14 years ago, uh, he said, you know, before there may have been some resistance, but not anymore. People are getting used to implants and referenced also um, skin, um, uh, well, tattoos, basically. Uh, he said, new century, new trend. We will be the... Uh, hybrid of electronic intelligence and our own soul, and meaning, of course, in reference to desensitizing people, the public, to implants by way of tattoos and electronic tattoos. And by the way, I'll just say this, uh, a couple of years ago, the University of Illinois announced that they had created an electronic skin tattoo with RFID technology 
So if you if you look at the acceptance in the West, we'll say of tattoos, isn't this just a good way to grease the skids a bit to uh, uh, usher in this okay, this branding, this mark of the beast technology, in addition to the bloodletting that you referenced and the satanic symbology behind that. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Thank you, Doug. And again, ladies and gentlemen, please hear my heart. Because there's a good chance that part of the listening audience out there has, they have their Christian tats, they have no problem with it, and they're wondering what's the big deal. And I'm not against you, ladies and gentlemen. The purpose of all of us as Christians, the, the point of all of us, the challenge, the homework for all of us as Christians is to constantly educate ourselves through the scriptures and make adjustments and repent. If we find that we're doing things that are prohibited or not in the best interest of our spiritual health, then we meet, need to make adjustments. We shouldn't grab onto them with a white-knuckle grip and say, I don't care what you say, this is the way I believe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, if it's going to damage the outcome of your spiritual health, then is it really worth it? And, Doug, that's the bottom line. And, and I want to, I see that the clock, we have a few minutes. I want to wrap this up, and this is what I want to say. I, I want to talk about where we are in the spiritual clock, in the, the end time. There, there are a variety of descriptions that we could use to describe where we are. Indeed, it seems that it's continuing to happen like molasses in slow motion, but in, in the... In the way that they are doing it in slow motion, Doug, they're being more successful. If it happened quick, more people would protest. But since it's happening in slow motion, look at all the things happening from the south. Now, I was on your program a few months ago, and we talked about the invasion that was coming from the south. I, I spent an entire broadcast talking about, and again, I use the scriptures because as what I believe the Holy Spirit revealed to me that the Bible, the, the United States of America is going to follow what we read in the Bible with what happened to Israel. We can see a similar thing. We're going to rhyme with Israel. And if we look at how the turn of events occurred to Israel, how the warnings took place, and then how the events transpired, we can see a similarity. Well, I was on your program several months ago, Doug, and we talked about Ezekiel chapter 20 and 21. And in Ezekiel 20, verse 45, and this is on record, this is just a flashback, Doug. But I'm, I'm sharing this to show how the Bible's right on, how it is true that we can find the outline of what's going to happen by looking at the Scriptures. It's not that I, I'm, I'm smart or anything. It has nothing to do with me. It's in the Scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. So if we look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 46, it says, Son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south, and say to the forest in the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you. It shall devour every green tree and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched. All faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. Kindled it, it shall not be quenched. We talked about this, Doug, before the invasion that's happening now. And we discussed that, according to what I read right here, the invasion is going to happen from the south. Something is going to occur from the south, very pivotal, very profound. And we even discussed that that includes an invasion of the United States. I believe that we did qualify. I believe that I did say I don't know exactly how it's going to play out exactly, but the Bible's saying the south, therefore, keep your eyes on the south. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, look at Drudge. Look at the last few weeks. We have an invasion from the south. If we go to Ezekiel 21, we can also continue to read. It talks about the gates. 21, Ezekiel 21, 15. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, and their heart that their heart may melt. In other words, every gate of Jerusalem was invaded, north, south, east, and west. So it goes on. That's what it's saying. And then we talked about this, Doug. The gates of America, from coast to coast, an invasion eventually will happen. The nuclear subs eventually are going to fire missiles into America. We're going to see missile, the, the ships unload, the, the, uh, the ships will come and unload the, the troops, the soldiers. And from the north, we're going to see them come across the Canadian border. We'll also see them come from the south. The United States is going to be invaded eventually. 
Now, Nathan, how can you say that? Are you sure about that? Yeah, it's right here. It's in the Scriptures. It's going to happen. By the way, in addition to the Scriptures, God has also shown different individuals. Dimitri Dudeman saw the invasion from the south. So also besides him, other watchmen, other individuals, go to YouTube. People have had visions of this thing. Well, Nathan, where is it then? How come it hasn't happened yet? If it hasn't happened, you're making it up. You're a liar, etc. No, ladies and gentlemen, it starts in the spiritual, and then it happens in the physical. We saw the spiritual invasion, the Olympic ceremony, the demons came in. I mentioned all that, the Nurgle thing, the demons. And now we have the, the beginnings of the physical event with illegal immigrants. By the way, those immigrants that are on the rafts coming across the Rio Grande or crossing the fence, in, in, in the mix of those families and moms and dads and children, we also have gangsters. We also have MS-13 gang members. We have cartel members who are going to come into the United States and wreak havoc in our country. It's, and being that it's starting in the south, those of you that live in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California, I just want to warn you, ladies and gentlemen, prepare to see very disturbing news stories where murderers are illegal aliens are murdering american citizens where cartel members are are murdering american citizens where neighborhoods are going to be taken over by the cartel members in the past we had the regular wannabe gang members doug we're going to see these gang members who are influenced by the demons of hell itself coming from the south we have the images on my website of that tattoo conference those those individuals are from venezuela those are the, the types that are going to come to a neighborhood near you, ladies and gentlemen. So if you live in Texas, I just want to say, Mom and Dad, you better start praying for Psalms 91. And from the practical measures, you better figure out ways to protect your family. Arm yourselves. Figure out a way to protect your family because this thing is going to ramp up. This is an invasion that is being done on purpose. It is a false flag event. It is a clandestine false flag event that is arriving right now, and we're going to, Doug, in those suitcases and those backpacks that the illegals are bringing, we have weapons of mass destruction that are coming across the border. We have horrible, who knows what type of gas type things. False flag events are coming, and they're pouring across the border right now. It is so, it makes no sense. When you, when you, when you look at what TSA requires of American citizens at the airport, take off your shoes, Grandma. The nuns, take off your underwear. Let's see what you have in your bra. Really? And you have the illegals bringing their backpacks without being stopped right now with the weapons of mass destruction? With who knows what's in those backpacks, Doug? What's coming through? What do we have? Well, uh, you, yeah, we're not allowed to ask those questions, Nathan, of course. And, and while, you know, while the Border Patrol, the other thing, too, is while the Border Patrol is tending to admittedly the uh, un- un- unaccompanied Ill- illegal alien minors of course you've got the open porous nature um while the border patrol is otherwise uh handling uh, the babysitting duties so you've got a, a double whammy here you've got uh, um a- and Nathan uh many of these people are being transported against the federal law numerous federal laws by the very government that established the laws to various other cities across the United States. So this is a horrific, horrendous situation. It's not a humanitarian crisis. And by the way, I'm going to go on record here and say um, I totally disagree 100% with Glenn Beck. Uh, Let me be on the record in saying that. I think that his whole approach to this is very narrow minded and very nearsighted he is uh uh being too politically correct and too tolerant for an intolerable situation go ahead nathan thank you and i agree with you doug because i mean side note by the way what is that show paid opposition Uh, that would be another program but yeah yeah Uh, it's it's ridiculous what is really seriously what's there not to understand about the term illegal alien i don't get it it's pretty it's pretty um concise there's no ambiguity with that this is lawless this is lawlessness by the renegade in chief and gentlemen doug and joe if we look at all of the 
potential crisis tipping points that are coming across the border right now, they span so many ingredients that could be responsible, just one of them taken for, for taking this nation down. But we have the potential for a massive pandemic, a pestilence in so many different forms coming across, and that's happening now. We have the ingredients for, on a minor level, a scabies epidemic and, uh, of lice and, and other creepy crawlers throughout the airlines and every airplane because they're putting the, these children in the airplanes and you can see the lice on their face crawling and the friendly skies are full of lice now, Doug. So we have that going on. And then we have on, on top of that the uh, drug crisis that's going to increase and the, the crime infestation that's going to start in the south. But as these people are deported and placed in – and I mean, how brilliant is it for the, the – demons of hell to place Trojan horses in these illegal, quote-unquote, innocent children. When you have gang members who are going to recruit and they come in acting like children and then they get relocated to all parts of the country. So you have these gang members who are getting a free ticket to every corner of America so that they can go and start recruiting. And so we're going to see uh, an infestation of gang activity that's going to just be off the Richter scale of of public. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, and and I also agree too. If you go back a couple of shows, Nathan, you, you spell it out pretty well. The the uh, satanic aspect of this, which is overlooked by every media, well, of course, it's not even addressed by the media, but 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 there is a satanic element here, and we have evidence, by the way, of uh, of. Uh, 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 well, this was a planned event, of course. If you go back into January, February, the, the federal government had posted uh, job uh, openings for uh, escorts for juvenile, juvenile escorts, uh, for this very purpose. So well, people think, Nathan, and they erroneously believe that this is just some sort of sudden humanitarian crisis when, in fact, it's a manufactured cloud piven strategy that uh, – is destined to eradicate our sovereignty, our nationality, our culture, our spirituality, and bring in not only disease and pestilence, but a very satanic element all across the United States. And if people think that that's uh, bigoted or racist, then uh, so be it. Live in your live in your uh, 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 rainbow uh, world with the puppy dogs and uh, uh, pretty kitties, because this is reality, and we should all be adults here. Indeed. Ladies and uh, Doug and Joe, and ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to wrap this thing up. This is what I want to say. As we're looking at the border crisis, now they're how many steps ahead, Doug? Twenty steps, thirty steps. They have their calendar. They have their timeline. This is what we're going to do in 2014, and then 2015, and so forth and so on. They have it all spelled out. So we are watching the introductory elements of the plan definition, uh, the demolition of America. What we're watching right here is just the very beginning stages, because as it continues into the end of this year and next year, et cetera, we're going to watch the multifaceted involvement of, of course, the political madness that's going to also bring the Trojan demonic elements in, and the demonic infestation is going to take place in several categories. The scout demons are coming in right now, possessing these, some of these illegals, and they're going to play a role in being provocateurs in events in the United States future. They're going to plague the dwellers of the United States. They're going to then influence the infrastructure and bring demolition and destruction to the infrastructure. And then they're also going to come in, open the back door, just like the Joker did at that mad shooting in Colorado, open the exit door and bring more in. And then we're going to have more demons come in. The invasion will increase. We're going to see societal changes. We're going to see more events, news events, political events. And as that happens, we're also going to continue to see the demonic stupor where most of the population doesn't get it, and they just scratch their heads and live their normal lives until we finally get to the, the location where we are occupied. Full-born, Iron Curtain, demonic, Marxist, communistic occupation. America is now a new creature, and we'll be there. But that's where we're headed. Now, real quick, I want to give a verse for the people to leave with. We, we, we were talking about leaving the country. 
You remember that, Doug? And you were saying, well, how can we? Where, where do you go? Etc. Right. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to leave this with you. When Jeremiah was asked by some of the remnant people, what should we do? Should we go to Egypt or, or should we stay? And Jeremiah sought God and asked God, well, what do I tell them? And then God gave them the information. God told them what to do. And God shared with them that if they stay there, he would watch over them. And in Jeremiah 43, chapter 14, I want to leave you with this. Let me find it right here. If you have your Bible or you're just taking notes, 43, 14. Uh, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, not 43. I got it wrong. Uh, 42. 42, 13 and 14. But if you say, we will not dwell on this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall see no war, number one, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, number two, nor be hungry for bread, number three, there we will, dr- will, will dwell. God goes on to say, I will punish you if you do that. So here's the outline right here of what we can do spiritually if we have to live in the occupied zone. And the majority of our listeners are going to live in the occupied zone, Doug. So here's the formula right here. Verse 14, Jeremiah 42, 14. They said that we do not want to go where we will see no war. So number one, they didn't want to have, and these are spiritual applications. They didn't want to have spiritual war, number one, or hear the sound of the trumpet. The sound of the trumpet is the voice of Jesus. They didn't want to hear the voice of Jesus to direct them. And number three, be hungry for bread. Well, that's the living bread of life, the 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 life of Jesus. So spiritually, we have to do war, spiritual warfare, hear the voice of Jesus, and be hungry for his bread, and then we can live in the occupied zone and function and survive. And I see the time. I'm going to leave it with that, Doug, and I'll quit. Thanks for having me. God bless you. God bless you too, Nathan. And as always, it's been a, a great show, and we can't wait to have you back on. Uh, you take care, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Until tomorrow, we'll be joined live with Catherine Austin Fitz. God bless, stay safe, and say a prayer uh, for those in the world, those believers in the world who are struggling with uh, fear or any temptations or any problems uh, that they look to the Lord for the solution. Have a great night, everyone.